I'd now like to welcome our next speaker, Kate France. As an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota Duluth, she received two scholarships from AHA, including the Helen N. and Harold B. Shapira Undergraduate Scholarship, which is a local scholarship here in Minnesota, and the Empowered to Serve Scholarship, which is a national program that only selects 10 recipients per year. Kate was also recently named as one of six undergraduate finalists in the National Collegiate Inventors Competition. After graduating last May, Kate decided to continue her education at UMD as a graduate student studying pharma, sorry, pharm <laughs> pharmacogenomics. It's, a, it's an interesting one for me, um, pharmacogenomics. Kate will share about the development and evolution of her medical bracelets and why scientific innovation is critical to improving community health. Take it away, Kate. Hello, everyone. I just first wanted to say thank you so much for the American Heart Association and all that you've given me in support and inviting me here today. Um, I'm so excited today to be able to tell you about my journey. And in this, I really want to make it as interactive and exciting for you guys as possible. So I will be asking you to utilize the chat. It is going to be a very fun talk, I hope, for you all. So if we could go to the next slide. Like I said, we're gonna be talking about a few of the things that I've been honored to be able to do. Um, but before I do that, I'm gonna expound on my introduction just a little bit more. We'll go to the next slide. So my name, <laughs> or what I go by professionally today is Kate France, Certified Quality Science Professional. And I have founded my own med tech corporation called Scientists Making Your Life Easier, or Smile with a Y, LLC. Through this company, I create a system of QR code based medical bracelets called the Medical Assistance via Quick Response Code or MAQR bracelets. And we'll be talking a lot more about those in a little bit. Um, today, I am a first year pharmacy student at the University of Minnesota, and I am our Duluth uh, campus representative, which is the equivalent of class president. And we'll be talking about a few of my other accomplishments, but my personal favorite uh, has to be being a part of the class of 2020 Empowered to Serve Scholars uh, through the American Heart Association, which recognized my work in serving uh, underserved populations and their need for better ac access and equity in health and care. We'll go to the next slide. But what I wanna to talk to you guys today about is something that's really important to me. And while today I may be Kate France and have all of these letters after my name and all these fancy accolades, for a long time I was simply Caitlin France, a high school student at Hinkley Finlayson where I was involved in a bunch of different activities, everything from cheer to golf to acting on the stage. I also served as our school's uh, mascot. You'll see me here as the Jaguar, uh, out hanging out with some elementary schoolers. And long before I was ever a soon-to-be doctor, I worked at a gas station. So if you ever stopped at Toby's to get a cinnamon roll on your way up to where I live here in Duluth, you might have seen me if you stopped to get some coffee as well. Um, and why I want to bring this up today, guys, is so often when people ask me, you know, how did I get so far on this journey and really try to compare themselves to me, what I want to expound to you is that there is no wrong way to get to where you are. In fact, I've got a question for you all today. I want you guys to interact with this chat as much as we can. So my first question for you all is this. So people ask me, you know, how, how did you know what you wanted to do? So for those of you who think you know what you're doing, if you've got your life planned out, you know what you're going to be doing next and how you're going to accomplish it, interact with the chat. You can put your name in there, say me, tell me about what you're doing. Just interact and show me for those of you who think you've got your stuff figured out. I want to see you guys. I'll give you a few seconds. Don't be afraid. I'm sure there's at least a couple of you. And there's going to be a couple different categories, so don't worry if you don't fit into this one. Let's see if there's any brave souls. All right. Some of you... No one is saying that they've got their stuff figured out. Okay, so for those of you who are less certain of what you wanna do, but still think you've got a pretty good plan figured out. Yeah, I see some maybes in the chat. Yep, so for those of you who fit into this category, um, who have got a general idea of what you wanna do, um, but aren't really sure yet, I wanna see you guys commenting in the chat. Don't be afraid, I promise. 
Yeah, awesome. Thank you guys for interacting. I appreciate it. So we've got a few more in the maybe category. And then last but not least, those of you who have no idea what you're doing and have got so much ahead of you and are so excited to just learn more and figure life out, um, go ahead and interact in the chat. Yeah, this is my favorite category. Those of you who've got a lot ahead of you. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much for participating. I really appreciate it. So what I want to talk to you guys today about is to give you advice on how I got this far. But before I do that, I want to explain to you that I was never always in that first category. For when I was in high school and your guys' age, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my future. And it wasn't until I received some incredible mentorship that inspired me to go along my way. Okay. So once I got to college, I kind of had things figured out and moved more into that middle category. And then I got to work in some incredible labs where I learned about pharmacogenomics and health inequities and realized what I wanted to do. But now that I'm back in pharmacy school, I'm back in that first or second or those middle two categories where I'm not really sure what I want to do, but I can't wait to figure it out, which brings us to the thing I want to teach you next. So I know you guys are at home and all muted, but you're going to be saying this next phrase out loud with me, okay? It's a really important one. We're going to go to the next slide. I don't know. Say it out loud and keep practicing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, okay? So this is the first part, but you might sense a but coming, and there is. We'll go to the next slide. So I don't know, but I'm willing to learn. This is such an important phrase that I was taught early on in my career. And the reason that it's so important is my wise mentor, Dr. Cynthia Welsh, once told me that admitting what we don't know is the first step to figuring it out. And this is going to be something that is so critical throughout our time, especially for those of us entering the STEM field. So often people come to us and think we have things totally figured out. But in reality, there's so much that we don't know, but it's so exciting to be able to learn about it. Okay. So remember the phrase, I don't know, but I'm willing to learn. We're going to go to the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, I probably had a little bit of a different background than you all. I am from a town with more cows than people. I grew up in Hinkley, Minnesota. Go Jags. And in this, I graduated with a class of 37 people. Yes, I knew everyone and I knew their parents and their grandparents, um, but I didn't have a lot of resources growing up throughout this time. So because of this, I got to work really hard at ensuring that I had good mentors because these mentors, like Stacy's video mentioned, really helped inspire me and move me on to where I am today. So in the next slide, We'll take a look at a couple different photos. And I know I look a little bit out of it in these photos. And that's because I was so excited because what you see here is the aftermath of me finding out that I was going to the International Science and Engineering Fair. Now, when some students think science fairs, they think baking soda volcanoes. But these science fairs were kind of like the Olympics of science fairs. There were students inventing new kinds of batteries, solving cancer and Alzheimer's, and doing incredible work. And I was chosen not once, but three times to represent the state of Minnesota and attend these fairs. But before and long before I was able to do that, I owe my journey to the two people on the left standing next to me. We'll start on the far edge. That is Dennis D'Artagnan Boxrud, one of my high school science teachers, who, while he didn't quite understand why I was so passionate about the project or really what I was doing, was such an advocate for me and always encouraged me in um, more supportive ways. So oftentimes um, people think that a mentor has to be this person who knows everything and is really well connected to what you're doing. But sometimes you just need those people who are your cheerleaders and are there to support you. And that's what Dennis Boxroot has been for me for years. The person in the middle though, this is the person who I want to give my biggest shout out and gratitude forever to. That is Dr. Cynthia Welsh. And for those of you who are adults in the audience, you're really going to appreciate this. Dr. Welsh holds a PhD in chemistry, but she chooses to teach 
um, middle school science because she finds that education and especially for young women and indigenous kids in STEM, she finds it that important that she chooses to teach it. And without her support, I would not be where I am today. When Dr. Welsh heard about the project that I was doing that we'll be discussing in a few slides, she, not, she took me under her wing and was the first person to show me how to do so many different aspects of science. I'll never forget the moment where I got to sit down and run statistical analysis that proved that my invention had the capabilities of saving lives. Dr. Wells showed me not only what a woman in science looked like, but what we could achieve and what I could continuously work towards. And not only that, but on the photo on the right, she introduced me to one of my best friends, a person who would continue to advocate for me and support me throughout our scientific journeys together. And this really demonstrates the importance of finding those people who share common interests, because you'll never know how far you're going to be able to get together. Next slide. So with that bit of sappy advice, I've got another key tip for all of you, which you'll see here in giant font. I want you guys to apply for everything. And this specifically goes out to the young women in the audience, okay? So one of my heroes in life is a woman named Rashma Sajani, and she is the person who founded Girls Who Code. Now, I might not do a lot of coding in my project, but it does involve QR codes. So I did get to learn a little bit of coding through my project. But what Dr. Sejani found is that young men who were entered in coding programs were always willing to show the mistakes that they had made and receive help when working on their coding pieces. But the young women who she was working with, rather than showing the fact that they had a mistake, would delete everything that they had been working on and just keep restarting and restarting rather than accepting the fact that they weren't perfect. And what I want to explain to you guys is that you by no means have to be perfect. You do not have to hit every criteria that a scholarship asks for. You just need to be willing to put your name out there. Because even though coding accounts for maybe 10% of the project that I was working on, I was chosen as a national finalist from the Aspirations in Computing and received uh, a scholarship and national uh, accolations, which was incredible. So always be willing to put your name out there. We'll go to the next slide. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a proud empowered to serve scholar. And when I first applied for that, I knew I was throwing my name in a hat with thousands of other applicants and knew that only 10 of us would be chosen. So I was incredibly honored to be one of those 10. Um, and the $10,000 scholarship that I received through this has been an incredible support for me throughout my time in college. But what I love about this slide, and I don't have the picture up yet because it was just released, um, but so not only do I work to do a all sorts of different scientific roles. I also work to support other students who are interested in it. I've got mentees who are high schoolers like you, first year college students, and even some who are older than me. And one of my students just a few weeks ago also won the Empower to Serve Scholarship. Akshara Maladi is now a part of this year's class. And I got to write her letter of recommendation for this award. So there's so much that you can do if you are willing to put your name out there and the funding that you receive from it can be such an incredible help for you on your journey. We'll go to the next slide. Now this is one that I am definitely most proud of. So <laughs> this was a very recent award from the National Inventors Hall of Fame. That's right, guys, the National Inventors Hall of Fame. It's still surreal to me that my face and my product were featured on anything as big and incredible as this. This was put on by the US Patent and Trademark Office, and it really shows that even though I held only a provisional patent over my project, I was still so excited and passionate about what I was doing that I was chosen as one of the top six in the nation for this award. And there's so much incredible opportunities out there if you're willing to look and willing to put yourself out there. So keep trying and keep applying for all these different awards, okay? We'll go to the next slide. This is my favorite piece of advice. So speaking of putting yourself out there, I want you all to be more annoying. 
And the reason that I say annoying and not brave is very significant. So when people told me that I was doing so many incredible things and that I was such an inspiration, there's a lot of these big words that people get freaked out about, such as brave. So instead of telling my students to be brave, when I told them to be more annoying, it's less scary, right guys? So what do you think of when you think of annoying? Put it in the chat. I wanna hear what you guys think of. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Don't be afraid, there's no wrong answer. Do you, yep, continuous follow-up, yep. And some people think it's a bad thing. That's right, but I want you guys, when you're annoying, here's what you need to do. When you come from a place that doesn't have a lot of resources, or even if you have a lot of resources, you gotta go out and find them. And it can be a persistent and repetitive process. I love these words. Um, what you are trying to do is find those people who will support you. So what I did is I went on my school's website at UMD and I looked at every single professor who was doing research. And I went through and I made a huge spreadsheet and I found every professor who I thought was doing cool work. And I emailed every single one of them. I, there was probably more people I emailed than people I graduated with. It was a huge number of them. And when I did it, it was pre-COVID. And so it worked out great because I got free breakfast for weeks. All of the professors on campus would buy me coffee and we'd get to just sit and talk about research. And it opened so many doors and taught me so many things. Um, one of the best things you can do after you've been annoyed is to sit back, listen, and soak up what these professors or mentors or whoever it may be are talking about because the, one of the best ways to learn is by listening. I once received the advice that we have two ears and only one mouth and we should be using them in those proportions. So using your ability to be annoying can open so many doors and teach you about so many different things. And it's how I got involved in my research lab. So without reaching out myself, I would have no idea what pharmacogenomics is. So take the time, be brave. And if bravery is too scary for you, be annoying, okay? We'll go to the next slide. So now that we've talked about how we can get involved. Let's talk a little bit more about research. And you'll see here on the screen that I have highlighted it as research because you got to do it again and again. Dr. Welsh often told me that in science, you never got the correct answer. You only get better questions. And I think that ties in really well to this quote, which is that research is to see what everybody else has seen and think what nobody else has thought. Research is all about just finding questions and finding new ways to address problems that you see in the world that no one else is working on. And through that, that is all about what my research, my company, and everything that I do, we're always asking new questions. And so with that, and if you guys have any questions, always put them in the chat. But before we get into that, I want to introduce you into someone really cool and really important in my world. So we'll go to the next slide. No, he's not a sandwich, but this peanut butter and jelly sandwich does look pretty delicious, right? The person that I want to introduce you to is a seven-year-old boy named Drew. And Drew has a severe peanut allergy. And Drew is going to go over and hang out at his fr new friend's house for the first time where the new friend's mom is going to make them some delicious peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch. So Drew and his friend play together all morning. They take one bite of the sandwich and then Mrs. Goodsky, the friend's mom, thinks, wow, the boys must have really played hard if Drew needs a nap in the middle of lunch. But what's happened here is that Drew has entered anaphylactic shock, which is what we call in science terms a severe food allergy. Okay, so if Drew doesn't receive help in about 10 minutes, there's going to be some pretty bad consequences. Thankfully, Drew in this situation wears a medical ID. But all medical IDs are for a standard one is a simple piece of metal with four lines of text in it. It'll tell Mrs. Goodsky his name is Drew, how old he is, that he needs an epinephrine auto injector, also known as an EpiPen, and where and that's really it. It's not going to tell her how to use the EpiPen, anything about the situation, or truly how to help Drew out of this medical emergency. But with my QR code-based medical bracelets, a simple scan of a 
the QR code will pull up a nearly limitless amount of information, including everything that they need to help Drew out of his medical emergency. So with that said, you might be wondering uh, a few different things. Go ahead and put any questions you have in the chat, but I'm gonna tell you guys the question that I get asked the most about this. And that is, how did you come up with that? And the answer is pretty funny. The answer is I got really mad and I got mad at a YouTube ad. We'll go to the next slide. You see, I was watching a YouTube video in my high school teacher's classroom when an ad popped up for medical IDs. And this particular one was advertised for on sale for nearly a hundred dollars. And I was absolutely flabbergasted because this was just a piece of metal with four lines of text in it. And it didn't really seem like it would really help in a medical emergency. And I remember asking two things, that costs how much? And how is this all that's available? And then I said the kind of sarcastic phrase, I think I can do better than that. And thankfully, my high school science teacher, Joe Ranger, overheard me. We'll go to the next slide. He said to me, if you think you can make the world a better place, why aren't you doing that right now? We'll sit on that one for a moment because those words really hit home for me. I saw this issue in the world, and rather than waiting for someone else to fix it, I knew that I could do something better. Even if I couldn't make a perfect thing right away, I wanted to start working on trying to improve the world through this one little step. So we'll go to the next slide. I spent that summer, um, so this started when I was a freshman in high school, so close to the age of many of you guys. And I spent the summer after my freshman year just researching all sorts of different medical IDs that existed on the market. So with standard medical IDs, many people knew what they were, but as I said earlier, they really weren't that great. So next I looked at medical tattoos. And I don't know about all of your guys' parents, but if I tried to tattoo seven-year-old Drew, I don't think his mom would like that very much. But medical tattoos are really cool because they are so customizable. You can put whatever you want on them. Um, and then the last thing that I looked at were something called RFID chips. Now these are really cool. They're small implantable chips that are put into people's bodies. Um, and then you are able to scan them and pull up information. And I really like the scanning aspect of these. However, uh, I knew that many people wouldn't be able to see the RFID chip once it was implanted and the technology to scan these isn't something that everybody has. So we needed to come up with something that would be recognizable, that was customizable, and that was accessible. So those were the first three things that I looked at. We'll go to the next slide. And throughout the nearly, let's see, six years that I've been working on this project, we've made a bunch of different prototypes, but we're gonna talk about three in particular today. So we'll start on the very far left. This prototype is what's known as a static QR code. And these are cool because they link to a text page. So when you scan this, it just pulls up a text page that doesn't require an internet access, and you can include whatever information that you'd like on this page. Now, these are great for people who don't have a changing medical condition, because once the information is set on a static QR code, it's like being online engraved. You can't update it. So it's not great for someone who, say, has a bunch of different medications that they change, but if you had something like heart disease, where it's pretty regular, the static QR code would be a great bracelet for you. Next, we'll move on to the dynamic QR code. Now, because so many of the people that I was working with had so many different moving parts to their um, different medical backgrounds, such as if you're diagnosed with a peanut allergy and you find out you have a tree nut allergy as well, or you are on one type of medication, but then they switch you to another one. Um, so I really wanted something that was updatable. So this is why we went with the dynamic QR code. Now this links to a web page that does require an internet access, but once you're on this web page, it can hold a nearly limitless amount of information. And we'll be going through a lot of that information in another slide. 
Now, now that we've got a really cool dynamic QR code that can pull up all of this information and save lives in a medical emergency, I thought, well, what else can we do to make this better? And the thing that came to mind is the fact that in many medical situations, you need other equipment. So let's talk about peanut allergies and Drew for a second. Drew needed an EpiPen, but he kept it in his backpack, tucked inside one of the inner pockets. But how was Mrs. Good Sky supposed to know that, right? Even if it was written, uh, ke kept in black backpack, there's hundreds of black backpacks at any elementary school. So I created a Bluetooth based carrying case. So what happens with this is by clicking a link, it activates a speaker in the carrying case that emits a high pitched noise. Someone in my control group once described it as a chihuahua being run over by a monster truck. So nice and quiet, right? Um, but it really helps you to find that auxiliary medical equipment faster. And once you have that, then you're able to help with the medical emergency. So those are the three different evolutions of the medical bracelet. We'll go to the next slide. Now, this is a mock-up of what the bracelet looks like today. It's going to include the same basic information um, that any standard medical ID would, but it's also going to include a medical insignia in indicating that it is medical equipment, as well as the words, scan me, so that people know how to operate it. But the reason why I want to talk about this slide is for some more in-depth analysis of why um, the evolution of these bracelets and the evolution of healthcare equity is so important. And this is what I like to think of as the bracelet of the future. It's going to address these three pillars. So the first of these is education. So oftentimes when we have medical emergencies, especially in rural communities like my own, you're not going to have trained EMTs, doctors, nurses, or people like that running onto the scene. You're going to have moms and dads, you know, family members, and sometimes in certain cases, just strangers on the street who are the first people reacting to these medical emergencies. So you need to create something that's going to be accessible to bystanders and that is written in a way that everyone is able to access it. The next thing that's really important to me is thinking about insurance and accessibility. So medical bracelets are actually typically not regulated by the FDA. They are considered what's called auxiliary medical equipment or kind of extra bonus equipment. So what that means is a lot of medical or insurance plans will not cover the cost of the bracelet. So that bracelet that we saw at the, earlier in the presentation that was a great deal is $100 that people are paying out of pocket. And every time that anything changes, that's another $100 to get that bracelet updated, which is just not reasonable. And the last system that I really work to address is kind of the systemic side of healthcare inequities, which is a lot of big words, but it's looking at, you know, why do some people have better access to care? And in a community like mine, when there was a medical emergency at my house, it took 40 minutes to an amp for an ambulance to arrive. And when we think about Drew needing medical attention within 10 minutes, those numbers are not compatible. So we need to create something that's going to allow bystanders to provide that immediate life-saving medical uh, support that's so critical to the first few minutes of the emergency. We'll go to the next slide. Now, I've talked a lot about what these bracelets look like and what the information comes up with. And most of the time, what we include is name, date of birth, emergency contact, blood type, donor status, medication list, previous surgeries, allergies, diseases, and conditions. But if we go to the next slide, what's really important here is that it's going to tell you what the emergency is, why it's happening, and what you need to fix it. So here we see if found seemingly unable to breathe, he needs the epinephrine auto injector, and clicking that link activates that carrying case, allowing them to find the EpiPen, and then further on, it shows how to use it. And this really allows people to actually help during those critical moments in a life-saving medical emergency. We'll go to the next slide. So I'll pause here if you wanna scan. I love to use working QR codes. This is the QR code that links to my website and this is the logo to my company. And what I wanna talk here just briefly about is the significance of something that Stacy also mentioned in her video and that's reaching down to help others up. Um, when I started this, I had no idea what a QR code was, let alone how to make one. And throughout my time working on this project, I now am proficient in coding, 3D printing, 
welding, welding, and so many other skills that I would not have gotten if I would have not been willing to address this piece, uh, the change that I wanted to see in the world. And throughout my time working on this project, um, one of the things that has been really important to me is not just reaching down to pull people up with me, but going down and going back to help people. I run an initiative called the Go Back to Give Back Foundation. And what we do is we go back into rural and underserved communities and provide support and mentorship to students who are doing incredible things such as Akshara Maletti being chosen as one of the American Heart Association scholars. I've got students who are filing patents, attending national and international science fairs. And I am always 3000% more excited about everything that my students are doing rather than what I achieve because you guys are the reason that I want to do what I get the privilege and honor of doing every day. So I just wanted to stop here and say thank you to all of you students. We'll go to the next slide. With my bracelets, we like to say that help is only one scan away. And with this slide, I always like to say that it's always um, to keep science exciting, I like to keep it fun. So my other tagline for the bracelet system is don't meet your maker, meet your M-A-Q-R maker. <laughs> and so it's important to keep uh, things light and joking as well. Science isn't all just hard science. You can have so much fun with it. We'll go to the next slide. And speaking of having fun, um, one of the things that I always try to do is um, to think beyond whatever I'm working on. So whenever I uh, find maybe one solution to one aspect of the project, I am going through and asking myself that next question of, okay, so what else sucks? What else needs to change? And one of the things that needs to change is the way that epinephrine auto injectors um, work and how that they are really expensive and really could use a lot of improvements. So this is one of the projects that I'm working on. We'll go to the next slide. And then I'm also continuously in the lab 3D printing and coding. And you'll get to see a really cool shot here of me and the bracelets. And we'll go to the next slide. And I'm also working as a first year pharmacy student. So I'm learning so much about drugs and all of that exciting innovations. And also through this, I get to work in that pharmacogenomics lab that we talked about earlier. So in this, I get to work on something called drug gene interactions. So what I get to work on here is better understanding um, why when we take medications, people experience different reactions to them. And through this work, we're able to better dose out medications, making uh, things like mental health drugs and uh, treatment for diabetes and just so many different categories, we're able to improve the care for them. So there's so many different ways to bring your skills together. I always like to tell students, um, there's an idiom that I love where it's jack of all trades, master of none. And the ending to that is actually still often better than a master of one. So being able to take all of your skills together is such a cool and important part of my job. And with that, I'm going to bring forward my very last piece of advice. This is a quote that I've come up with and something that I'm really proud of. And that's that I believe that what we create today is the inspiration for tomorrow and what a beautiful day tomorrow will be. Everything that I do, I hope to not only improve the world, but improve it in such a way that you guys are able to do the next best incredible thing. When I uh, was the first person in the Midwest to win the American Heart Association Empowered to Serve Scholarship, the very next year, one of my mentees was able to win it too. And that's what gets me so excited for the future is thinking about everything that you guys are going to be able to accomplish and how you are going to absolutely destroy me and blow me out of the water with the incredible work that you guys are going to have.